Um, so alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Again, I mean, we you guys had dinner and iftar. Are we good? Uh, Misaga has a great food scene, mashallah. Um, so alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, it's better. Hope everyone's doing well. Inshallah, it's always beautiful to be back in uh, the Mississauga GTA area. We're from I'm from Michigan, so it's not too far. Uh, it's a four-hour drive. I'm on the you know the better side of the border. Uh, you guys are more than welcome to come. Um, but really, uh, what makes these what makes um, these cities unique, and what makes Mississauga unique, and what makes Toronto unique, are not the skyscrapers. It's the masajid, or the it's the Muslims. Or else, why would we want to be in this community if we didn't have Islam Canada, all these beautiful masjids around us, and so on and so forth? Before, there was a time where Makkatul Mukarrama was known to be min ghairi the zara'in inda baytik al muharram. There was a time Makkatul Mukarrama was known to be a barren land that had absolutely no signs of life. It had nothing. Not, you wouldn't even see birds flying over it because it was a dead land. What allowed Makkah al-Mukarramah to become Makkah was Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail and Hajar building a masjid there, the Kaaba. And then it became an epicenter of life. It became the epitome of, uh, of light. Now everyone wants to go to Makkah. Similarly, there was a time that Madinat al-Munawwara was known as Yathrib. Anyone know what Yathrib means? Any? I mean, they told me people in Isna Canada are intelligent, so I see it. UFT, right? Waterloo, McMaster, all right? Um, so what, is, what does Yathrib mean? Gr huh? Okay, great. MashaAllah. Yathrib means sickness. It means flu. So the like, just imagine the name. I I'm not sure what Mississauga means. I still can't spell it. But Yathrib meant sickness. Literally, the name of the city was synonymous to people being afraid of going there. Because they were afraid if they went there, they would get sick. The Prophet's father passed away in Yathrib. The Prophet's mother passed away on her journey back from Yathrib. She got sick. When the Prophet of Allah entered the city, the name changed to al Madinatul Munawwara al Madinatul Tayyiba, The illuminated city and the purified city. The name changed completely. And the source of the name change was the Prophet ﷺ establishing a masjid, which became the source of life for that city and changed the entire trajectory of the community. So what truly gives us life and what truly gives us worth is the, are the masajid. So it's always an honor to be back in your community because of the masajid, because of all of you. May Allah reward you all, bless you all. And inshallah, allow this night to be a source of benefit for all of us, inshallah ta'ala. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد النبي العالمين الذي اسمه مكتوبا في الإنجيل والتوراة أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرح هو خير مما يجمعون وقال تعالى في مقام آخر والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أبا سفيان جئتكم بكرامة الدنيا وخير الآخرة أسلم تسلم أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم My dear brothers, sisters, fellow youngsters Every act and every thing that we commit to naturally has an objective and has a very clear intended outcome that we wish to secure when someone starts playing video games, even something as mundane as that, it has a very clear objective, go from level one to level two. When someone starts their, their schooling career, they have a very clear objective. I want to finish this major and I want to get into this career. When someone starts their career, there's a very clear objective. Everything worth doing in life naturally has an outcome that is clearly intended. And anything worth doing in life has an intended outcome. And if it doesn't have an intended outcome, then it's truly not worth doing. A sign of maturity is that whatever I commit my time, resources, and energy to, it's because there is an outcome that I intend from it, not simply for the sake of just doing it. We don't just do things for the sake of just doing things. We do it because it does give us an outcome that we hope to secure from it. Similarly, the blessed month of Ramadan comes with a very, a very clear outcome, a very clear objective. And that objective, if not secured, quite, quite frankly, means that that Ramadan was not used correctly. If that outcome is not secure, that means that month, though we filled the space of it, we never took from the soul of it. 
Though we filled the space of the masajid, we weren't able to internalize the qualities of the people of the masjid. Though we filled the spaces of the of the masajid, we weren't able to internalize the qualities that were read inside of taraweeh from the Quran. So there's a clear objective of this month. And that clear objective was highlighted by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he climbed upon the member one day. And as he climbed upon this member, his pulpit, he walked in the first step and he said, Ameen. And then he climbed the second step and once again he repeated, Ameen. And then he climbed in the third step and once again he repeated, Ameen. And the Sahabas that are observing this, they were very inquisitive, very present, and very observant. They see this and they have never seen this before. So they say, Ya Rasulullah, what was this that you just did? Each step you took, you said, Ameen, we've never seen this from you, please tell us what you were doing. And the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he responded to them by saying, the first step that I took, Jibreel Alayhi Salam descended from the heavens, and he made a very beautiful dua. And the dua was, rather it was a dua against certain people, which was, may Allah's wrath, may Allah's la'na be upon those people who hear my name and don't respond by saying sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So they hear my name, but they don't send durood upon me. Because the rule is wherever we hear the Prophet's name, we're supposed to respond by saying sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It's like whenever people say MJ's name, they say goat next to it. Like it's re- if you don't say goat, people get upset. Imagine the greatest human being of this world. If you say his name and you don't say sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it dismisses his greatness. Not that it makes a difference to him, it makes a difference to our tongue. مَا إِمَّدَحْتُ مُحَمَّدًا بِمَقَالَتِي وَلَكِنْ مُدِحَتْ مَقَالَتِي بِمُحَمَّدًا صلى الله عليه وسلم, Where the poet says that the Prophet of Allah did not become more praiseworthy because I praised him. He did not become, he did not elevate in his ranks because I said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He, his worth and value did not increase because we praised him. That's you and I. His worth didn't increase because Allah has already told him, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ There's no one that can reach your level. You're an untouchable. You're the, you're the definition of a goat when it comes to Allah's creation. Rather, when I praise you, my life becomes praiseworthy. My tongue becomes praiseworthy because I was able to say your name. And then he walked in the second step and he said that the dua that was made is, May Allah's la'na and wrath be upon those people whose parents are alive at an elderly age and they still are unable to secure a gateway to Jannah. They have a shortcut. The shortcut is service to parents. But despite having that opportunity availed to them and available to them, they miss a clear shortcut of earning Jannah without serving their parents. And the Prophet responded by saying, Ameen. Jibreel is the one making the dua and the Prophet is the one saying, Ameen. This dua has very low chances of not being accepted because the Prophet is the one saying Ameen to it. And the Prophet himself says, Inni lam anan. After Ta'if, when he was pelted with stones, Jibreel came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, if you send la'na upon these people right now, we will destroy them. They will cease to exist. They harmed you physically and mentally. They tortured you by saying things like, did Allah not find someone better than you? What a horrible thing to say to someone. But you have the opportunity of just say the words and they will cease to exist. And the Prophet said, I don't send la'na upon people. But here he's saying, Ameen. Which shows you the significance of this dua. And the third dua that is made is on the third step, Jibreel said, May Allah's la'na and wrath be upon those people who enter into the blessed month of Ramadan and leave the month without being forgiven. Which highlights for us the objective of the month of Ramadan. Which is, as sinners, which every single one of us are, كل ابن آدم خطاء وخير الخطائين التوابون As sinners, our responsibility becomes how can I maximize the potential, the high potential of acceptance of Tawbah and make sure that I leave this month being forgiven? How can I find opportunities of being forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We're in the month of Ramadan. Every single moment is an opportunity of being forgiven. However, my topic is not about forgiveness. My topic continuing from what I spoke about earlier today is about something a little different. There are a few reasons why a person's forgiveness is halted. There are a few reasons why even in the month of Ramadan, 
the month of absolute acceptance of Tawbah, that even the largest, the most major sinner, if he chooses to raise his hands or her hands, drops a few tears, puts their head on the sajada, their Tawbah will be accepted. But there are still such unfortunate people that despite this potential sale of forgiveness, they're not forgiven. And the Prophet of Allah highlights two people that are not forgiven. Number one is a person who is a mushahin, who holds hatred in their hearts for others, who has animosity in his hearts for others. They have a sense of bughl, they have a sense of a, a, a hatred for Muslim brothers and sisters in their heart. This person is not forgiven. How is it possible that Allah is giving us a fire sale of forgiveness in this month and I am unable to forgive my own sibling for something that they've done to me? I'm unable to forgive my friends, my brothers and sisters in Islam. What is this fake delusion of Muslims are brothers and sisters in faith but someone that does me wrong, I cannot forgive them. This is hypocrisy because believers, abarruha qulub. We are forced to cultivate hearts that are ready to forgive. That regardless, now we're not saying being doormats. And we're not saying to be oppressed. But we're saying in the moments of opportunity of forgiveness, this is where Allah forgives. Our deen is cyclical. It has an ecosystem. Where the Prophet of Allah says, مَنْ سَتَرَ عَيْبَ مُسْلِمًا سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ It's very interesting. He says, Whosoever hides the sin of a believer, Allah hides their sins. So when we hide someone's sins, Allah hides our sins. The Prophet of Allah says, Irhamu turhamu. We forgive people, He forgives us. He says, Inna Allah fi al abdi ma kana al abdu fi auni akhi. That Allah will perpetually be in the support of someone as long as he or she is also helping someone else. So all of these impacts and effects of Allah's support, Allah's forgiveness, Allah's covering of us is dependent upon us doing it for somebody else. Where he subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَن يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Would you not wish for Allah to forgive you? Where he is saying that if you forgive, I shall forgive you. الرَّاحِمُونَ يَرْحَمُهُمُ الرَّحْمَانِ اِرْحَمُوا مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَرْحَمُكُمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ but the Prophet of Allah says, Allah forgives those who are able to forgive one another. So the first person whose tawbah is halted and suspended is a person who is unable to forgive people. And their heart is filled with a sense of jealousy, hatred, and animosity. The Prophet of Allah, one day, Anas ibn Malik, a young companion, came to him and he said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me one sunnah that I must live by. You know, we always ask, like, give me that one thing. You know, one-liner. Right, we're all big on these coats and these snippets and all of this great stuff. But those, you know, people like to watch like these lectures on 2.0 speed. Like why? What else do we have to do? Like 2.0 speed means I'm not really listening to, I'm not really listening to spiritually grow. I'm listening for that moment. Oh, that hit my heart. That hit the spot. The Quran doesn't, doesn't have moments of like highs. The whole Qur'an, well, why do we do a khatam? Because the idea of the khatam is when we're present, physically, mentally, and spiritually, there's not a specific eye that has to hit us. The entire Qur'an is impactful. It's not about looking for that snippet or for that moment, though it's perfectly fine for social media. I'm all right, guys, I don't mind. Don't, take the, don't snippet this part, right? But nonetheless, he's asking for that one, one thing. And the Prophet of Allah says to him, Ya Bunayya, إِنْ قَدَرْتَ أَن تُصْبِحَ وَتُمْسِيَ وَلَيْسَ فِي قَلْبِكَ غِشٌ لِأَحَدٍ فَفَعَلْ فَذَلِكَ مِنْ سُنَّةِ He says, oh my beloved son, if you can wake up in the morning and go to sleep in the evening without having any hatred in your heart for anyone, that is my greatest sunnah. That is the greatest sunnah. We have youngsters in our communities fighting each other over the things that we shouldn't even speak about in the masjid because our hearts are so filled with the sense of competition for the world. Our hearts are filled with the filth of this competition. And because of it, we can't forgive someone. We don't forgive, what, we, don't, we don't struggle with not forgiving someone because of something that is religious, something that has a religious connotation. It all has a dunyawi connotation. And it's not even worth it. 
Because dunya comes to an end very soon anyways. So the first thing is not being able to forgive one another. The second thing, which I wish to highlight in the time that I have left, is people whose parents are unhappy with them. We're all youngsters sitting here. I am unable to achieve the objective of the month of Ramadan if my mother or father are not pleased with me. Let that sit for a minute. It's not that my friend isn't pleased with me. It's not that my homie isn't pleased with me. It's my parents are not pleased with me. How can I commit to such a level of spirituality when the bedrock in the foundation is my mother's pleasure? Where the Prophet of Allah says, رِضَ الرَّبِّ فِي رِضَ الْوَالِدِ وَسَخَطُ الرَّبِّ فِي سَخَطِ الْوَالِدِ That the pleasure of Allah is contingent upon the father being pleased with the person. The pleasure of Allah is contingent upon the mother's joy for their children. We live this entire year fulfilling all of our own desires, spending time with our own friends. Our parents don't have someone to have iftar with. Many of our parents, how many iftars do we do with our own parents? And how many iftars do we do with our friends? How many iftars, how many suhoors do we do for our parents? How many times have we brought iftar home for our parents? How many times have we cleaned the house for our own parents during the month of Ramadan? What is this fake delusion of spirituality? This tahajjud, this qiyam, this qira'ah, this fasting brings no benefit of forgiveness if my mother is not pleased with me. This is the words of the Prophet. These are not my words. If my father is displeased with me, this is a sense of shaitan manipulating or manipulating a sense of spirituality upon us and allowing us to commit to such depths without having the surface level that we need to have, which is our parents' pleasure. And every single one of us, if our parents are alive, and if our parents are not alive, go visit them in their graves and say salam to them. Serve your khalas and your uncles. Serve their friends. A man came to Umar and said, my parents are not alive, what should I do to earn their happiness? He said, be kind to their friends. Those same aunties and, and uncles that are really annoying, that are our parents' friends, being kind to them also makes Allah happy. Abdullah ibn Umar was traveling one day for Hajj and he had his animals for Hajj. And as he was traveling with these animals, he stopped by a certain area and he met a man. And the man was hosting him and he said to him, are you the son of so-and-so? And the man responded by saying, yes, I am the son of so-and-so. And he told the people of his caravan, take all my animals and give it to him. And as they moved forward, the people asked, well, why would you give all your animals to this person? And he responded by saying, this is a man whose father was very beloved to my father. That's it. Nothing more. He hasn't done anything for me. But my father loved being around him, so I love him as well. That's, where, that's how they sought forgiveness. How can a person earn Allah's forgiveness if we are the source of shattered hearts for our mothers? Many of our mothers are walking on eggshells when we live in that house. They're afraid. There are literally parents who are afraid to tell their children what to do because they cannot gauge the type of response they will get from us. If they say something, they're not sure how this child will respond to them because we respond due to emotions. We don't respond due to principles. A sign of maturity is we don't respond based on emotions. We don't have a sporadic spectrum of responses. We have consistency. That I know what I'm going to get from this person. Be it a day of ease or a day of difficulty, he or she will not be sporadic in their responses because they respond based on principles and values. The mother can say whatever he or she, or the father can say whatever he wants. But the child's responsibility is to earn their pleasure. We ask for du'as. People of the past earned their parents' du'as. Earning a dua. We always say, why is it so that my parents are making dua for me and it's not accepted? Because there's a difference of asking for a dua and earning a dua. Earning a dua comes from the heart. Earning a dua means we serve for it. Earning a dua means that the mother doesn't even have to say it. She just feels it in the heart and the acceptance is already there. More, more worthy of i'tikaf in the month of Ramadan and jihad in the path of Allah was a mother of a sahaba where a man came from Yemen. This young sahaba traveled all the way from Yemen, came to the Prophet ﷺ. And as he came to the Prophet of Allah, he says to the Prophet of Allah, 
I came from Yemen all the way here. The Prophet says, why did you come here for? And he responded by saying, I came here simply to serve you. To fight in the path of Allah. To learn your religion. To be with you in your company. And the Prophet of Allah asked his young companion. The Prophet had firasa, he had intuition. He says to him, well, when you left, was your mother happy or was she crying? When you left to come to such a virtuous act of serving me, was your mother pleased or was she upset? Was she laughing or was she crying? And the man responded by saying, my mother, when I left, she was crying. The Prophet says, go back. There is nothing in the world more worthy in being in the company of the Prophet Just by being in his company, you are now guaranteed Jannah. We justify leaving our parents for virtuous things. For things that are justified to be virtuous. For things that, are, that fall under the framework and the definition of da'wah. The definition of being with our siblings and friends. And the definition of hanging out. We can just, as youngsters in this time and age, I believe we have the ability to justify anything. This man came to serve the Prophet. The Prophet says, go back. And make her laugh the way you made her cry. And leave her as she's smiling, not as she's crying. How many of us leave the home at times that our mothers are upset at us? What if that was the last time we meet our mother? You can, you can, you can craft how you meet people as your first impression. But you cannot craft how you meet people as your last impression. And last impressions are lasting impressions, not first impressions. What if, what if that is the last time my mother meets me? What if that was the last time my father meets me? What if that's the last time I'm able to serve them? These are opportunities that people who have lost their parents will literally do anything in this world for. Ask a youngster whose mother or father isn't alive in the month of Ramadan what they would do to have iftar with them again. What they would do to serve them again. What they would do to be in their company again. A friend lost here and there. Count it. It's a dime a nickel. They come and they go. Parents are only two. Parents are only there for a certain amount of time. And if I can't build up the courage to say no to a friend to serve my mother, that's not love then. That's not true love. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, says to his companions that if I was leading Maghrib Salat, a fard prayer, and from the corner of my house, my mother was to say, Ya Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I would break my prayer and say, Labbayka wa sa'adayka, ya ummi. Oh, my mother, I'm right here. I'm right there. Tell me what you need from me. The Prophet of Allah, on his journey back from Hudaybiyah, on his journey back from Hudaybiyah, he stopped in an area called Abuwa. Abuwa was the area where his mother was buried. He lost his mother at the age of five. And he remembered where she was buried because he loved his mother. And he stops at this area. And Umar says, the Prophet was always with us. So we always knew where he was. But suddenly he disappeared. And we can't see him anymore. And we started becoming anxious. Did something happen to the Prophet? So we start looking for him. And from a distance we could hear a loud noise. As if someone was sobbing. And as we come close, we see the Prophet of Allah sitting like this. With his head wrapped in his, in his lap. And his body shaking. From how much he was crying. And Umar comes and he hugs him from the back. He says, that's enough Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet of Allah says, Oh Umar, you don't know who is here. You don't know why I'm crying. He says, Ya Rasulullah, what, what, what's, what's making, how can we help? And he says, this is, the, this is the resting place of my mother. How I wish she could have seen what has happened with her son. How I wish she could have been here with me. That is one of the only times a prophet sobbed at the grave of his mother. If your parents are alive, that is a clear route to Jannah. How is it so 
that we can justify everything to not obey them. Like there comes a point where we tell ourselves that isn't it too much? Isn't it too much to tell our mother or father that I have this and I have that? Like if I could redo something, we're five brothers. My youngest passed away, rahimullah, two, three years ago in a car accident. If I could redo something as being, well, whatever they call a scholar in today's time, and living half the year outside of my house, would really be staying home and serve my mother more. Some of us don't have that opportunity. And some of us would do anything to have that opportunity. Those same parents who raised us, who built us up, who took care of us. Now those mother's hands shake when they hold a bottle of water. That doesn't break your heart. That same father is unable to walk without a cane. That same father is unable to drive in the cold because his hands shake. Man, like, it ain't worth it if it means that we can't serve them. Why move out if you can live with your parents? Why not serve them if you have them with you? That is the ultimate source of forgiveness. Everything else for all of us sitting here that are young is secondary. It doesn't matter what they've said and done to us as long as we can, as long as we can serve them and live with them to a point that their heart is pleased with us. That is the goal. And of course, sometimes there's complicated relationships. We're not speaking about the exception. We're speaking about the rule. We're not speaking about the exception that, oh, my parents are like this or like that. The rule is consistent. This is the objective. A man came. This man thought he had an exception too. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ, a young sahaba like you and I, a young guy. He comes to the Prophet of Allah and says, Ya Rasulullah, I have a complaint. So what's your complaint? He says, my father who lives with me, he takes from my wealth. I go out every single day. I earn I work really hard, blood and sweat, time and energy, skill set, talent. All of that is used. I mean, first of all, who gave it to you? Who helped you? Who helped you? And being able to achieve that level of success. Musa alayhi salam and Ibn Kathir rahimullah mentions in the tafsir of Walamma Sakta Musa Ghadabu Akhdul Alwah that Musa alayhi salam, after losing his mother, one day, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to him, he says, Oh Musa, amhil, amhil, be careful, be careful. And Musa says, what, what do you mean, be careful? He says, your mother is now not around anymore. When your mother was around, she was praying for you. And now you don't have a mother's dua. You have to be wary of how you walk, how you move, what you say. Because you don't have a security blanket anymore. You had a security blanket. There was a companion, a sahaba, who was passing away. And the sahabas were around, a companion, sahaba. We're not talking about people in the 21st century like us, who are sinners, man. We're filthy people. These were sahabas. They were as pure as any human could be. This young companion is passing away, and the sahabas are doing talqeen of the kalima, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. And he just can't say the kalima. He can't recite it. He cannot repeat after them. And the sahaba start getting scared. Like, why, why are you not responding to us and saying the kalima? Because the goal is to leave this world saying the kalima. And they call the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet of Allah rushes. And he comes to this man and he starts reciting the kalima. And he still can't recite it. And the Prophet of Allah instantly says, Is one of his parents alive? And they say his mother is alive. This hadith is found in Nasa'i and other books as well. Authentic narration. So his mother is alive. He says, call him, call her, call the mother. And they rush to call the mother. The mother comes and the Prophet of Allah says, did your son do something to you that has displeased you and has broken your heart? And the mother says, yes. The Prophet of Allah says, Ya Ummah, please forgive him. He is unable to recite the kalima because your heart is still broken. He can't recite the kalima. The mother says, no, of course I forgive him. Because a mother would do anything for a child. I forgive him. And as she forgave him, the Prophet rushes back to the companion and they recite the kalima again and he's able to recite the kalima and pass away. Simply because the mother was able to forgive this child. And he was a sahaba. 
and we are who we are. We, no one needs to tell us who we are. We know who we are. Allama Iqbal says in Urdu poet, Apne man mein doob kar paaja churaghe zindagi. And um, a lot of you daisies are like, what? Yeah, you know, Urdu? Urdu. What's that? Right? I can tell a lot of you guys are daisies too. Right? So it's tough, tough love. He says, he says, Apne, how we can talk to our parents if we can't speak their language? <laughs> you know, um, he says, Apne man mein doob kar paaja churaghe zindagi. Tu agar mera nahi banta na ban, apna to ban. He says, D- he says, dive deep within yourself and look in the mirror. You know who you are. No one has to tell you who you are. We are who we are. We're not sahabas for sure. What if our parents are unhappy with us? We have no security blanket. We have nothing supporting us. The man, going back to the story of the youngster, he comes and complains to the Prophet of Allah. He has a legitimate complaint. You know, we always say here, both sides of the story, you know, this is a, like, this sounds very real. You know, listen to this person. Yeah, it's a legitimate complaint. It's a justifiable complaint. And my father takes from my wealth. And he eats from my wealth. I work hard and he takes from it. The Prophet of Allah says, well, of course, I have to hear both sides of the story. And he sends one of the companions and he says, can you call this person's father? And the companion rushes and he calls the father. And the father finds out why the prophet is calling him. Now, imagine what the father is feeling. Like, my son complained to the prophet about me. Like, like why? Why share the dirty laundry? Why tell the prophet? And as he's walking, he recites a poem in his head about how he felt. And he, as he comes to the Prophet the Prophet says to him, before you say a word and before I ask you a question, you must recite the poem that you read in your head to me. And the man says, Ya Rasulullah, every time I come and see you, my faith increases that you are a Prophet of Allah. How did you even know that I said something? And he said that Jibreel alayhi salam descended from the heavens and said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that before I ask you any questions, I must ask you to recite the poem that you had in your head. A father whose heart is broken, they don't have to say anything. Allah hears the voice of their heart. Allah hears in Urdu they say, Dil ki tarap. Like some of our parents are truly, and, I, and, I, and where I'm saying this because we travel quite a bit and some of the stories that we hear from parents are heartbreaking, man. Like children that are intelligent, rational, logical children like you and I are unable to find a way to please our father and mother. Like why? We can finish medical school. We can make it to the best program. But we can't find the means to make our mother smile, which is equal to an Umrah and Hajj. That's not a sign of lack of intelligence. That's a sign of lack of will and love. That's a sign of lack of purpose. I don't even want to do it because it's already there for me. The prophet says, recite that poem to me. And the father looks up at the prophet of Allah. And he says, He says, we gave birth to you and we took care of you as a toddler and we gave you all of the favors that you would want. Till the point that you started to grow. And the nights that you were sick and the nights that you couldn't fall asleep and the nights that you had a tummy ache, and the nights that you couldn't find a way to be at rest, it was as if I was the one struggling to sleep. It was as if I was the one who had a headache. Nobody loses sleep for someone except for parents. Nobody. I don't care how much they love you. When it hits bedtime, they go to sleep as if nothing is wrong. 
except for parents and maybe siblings if you're lucky enough. If you're fortunate enough, you have siblings, you're blessed like that. But most people, all they have is parents. Not even children are of that nature. Parents. If any of you youngsters are mothers or fathers now, would know what that means. Allah blessed me with a child two, three years ago, or actually two years ago. I'm hardly home, but I can tell you. I mean, I, I sleep. You know, I, I, I can't use that example for myself. But quite often, this kid, if he can't sleep, the mother can't sleep, the father can't sleep. It was as if I was sick. And now our parents get sick, ask for medication. I have, I have, I have a commitment. What, what, what does that even mean? I have a commitment more important than serving your mother? My brother, rahimullah, passed away picking up medication from a pharmacy to serve his mother. Do you think Allah will not give him Jannah? The kid passed away picking up medication for his mom to make sure that his mother has what she needs. Oh, I have a commitment. Have you thought with me today? I've already committed to my... So what? That, if the mother has to ask for something, you know she thought about it at least 10 times. Because she doesn't want to make it hard for us. He doesn't want to make it hard for us. When was the last time I turned my father's car on in the winter? Like when was the last time I put his jacket on? They say that America, the Canadian culture is different than the back home culture. You don't have to stand for your parents. Screw the culture that tells us that we don't respect our parents. We don't want that culture that tells us don't stand for our parents when they walk in the room. That's not a culture that we associate to. The culture that says, eat before your father eats. What are you talking about? This is not culture. This is simple etiquette that earns the dua of a father that will take us from being a nobody to being the greatest scholar or the greatest entrepreneur or the greatest physician. People that make it in life Islamically make it because their parents make dua for them. I promise you, us brothers would not have a single thing in our life if our mother wasn't making dua for us. And I'm not saying that out of humility. I'm saying that because we've seen it. Their du'as are fuel for our engine. And if you don't have that du'a, you don't know what you're missing. And if your parents are not alive, I say it again, visit their graves. Serve your khala. Serve your uncles. al khala to manzilatil um. Your khala is like your mother. Has the same ranking like your mother. The older sibling is like the father. Our prophet taught us that an older sibling is like a father. That we don't have the right to raise our voice in front of them. We don't have the right to disrespect them in front of people. The Prophet of Allah says, مَن, مَن لَمْ يُقَرْ كَبِيرَنَا وَيَرْحَمْ عَلَى صَغِيرَنَا فَلَيْسَ مِنَّا Whosoever does not honor their older siblings and their elders and does not give mercy and show mercy to those younger than them, the Prophet of Allah's words are, this person is not from amongst us. Like who are we trying to please when the hierarchy of honor is compromised? There is a hierarchy of who deserves our good character. And it's not the Tim Horton sister or brother that's serving us. It's not the person at Sobeys or Walmart. It's not the professor at university who doesn't care about us, doesn't even know our name properly. It's the person who loves us. It's he or she that wakes up in the middle of the night making dua for us. When was the last time as a youngster we woke up in the middle of the night making dua for someone? We don't know how to do it. Because our hearts are so fixated are in our own benefit that we don't know how to make dua for even our own parents. I was in Mecca to Mukarramah. We took a group of people to Umrah and a youngster standing next to me says to me, Musab, please tell me, I don't know what to make dua for after 30 seconds. I said, did you make dua for your parents yet? She said, no, not yet. Said, what are you making dua for if you're not making dua for your parents? That's what got you here anyways. That's what moves you forward. The man says, I couldn't sleep because you were sick. And we can't pick up medication because we have a commitment to go to the gym. Like this is the reality of how we are. This is not some illusion. This is a basic reality of youngsters living in North America right now. Parents are expendable. Parents are treated worse than senior citizens in senior citizen homes. They're walking on eggshells in the home that they purchased. 
because we don't know how to respond to them when they get upset at us. Just learn how to listen. I teach us brothers tell ourselves all the time, our parents are elderly now. Let them speak and just shut your mouth. My older brother says to us, you live with your mother, your honor, you, your honor is in serving your mother because when she speaks to you, you get reward simply listening to her. There are only three things that when you look at, you get reward. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah says there are only three things just by looking at them, you get reward. Can you imagine how precious and valuable these three things are? Number one, the Kaaba. We look at the Kaaba, just by looking at the Kaaba, our book of deeds are being filled with good deeds. There is no tawaf, there is no crying, there is no reading Quran. All there is is a sight of the Kaaba. Then he says, number two, looking at the Quran. Not even reading it, just looking at the Quran. And number three, looking at your parents in a way that makes them proud and makes them smile. Just looking at them. When our parents speak to us, I have, we have students, and my biggest pet peeve is when parents speak to them, they're on their phone. But when their friends speak to them, they're looking at them dead center in the eyes. What's up, brother? And when a sister speaks to them, it's even... Right. We can't even... We can't even look them in the face and speak to them. Because we're looking for the quickest gateway to leave. Are you done yet? Are you done yet is a statement. I don't think you can find a more disrespectful statement to someone. Are you done yet? Are you finished yet? Imagine telling someone's mother, are you done speaking to me yet? Your own mother. That person doesn't deserve to be forgiven. The Prophet of Allah's Amin is real. Where he said, that the objective of the month of Ramadan will not be reached because this person's parents have not forgiven them. And this man continues his poem and he says, Then I raised you to a point that when you pointed at a shirt, I bought it for you. You pointed at shoes, I purchased it for you. I took a loan to buy your car. I took a loan to put you to school. I had to borrow money to make sure your aid was worth it. Man, ask children, ask youngsters. We have youngsters in our community whose parents have passed away. On Eid, they don't experience the hug of the mother. I don't know what that Eid would look like without a mother around. I, I truly believe we won't be able to celebrate Eid without your mother. And our mothers are alive. And on Eid day, how much time do you spend with your parents? No, on the day of Eid, which is the most joyful occasion of the year, how much time do we spend with our parents? Success is not measured by anecdotes. Success is definitely not measured by emotions. Success is measured by metrics of what have you done for me lately? How much time do we spend with our parents on the day of Eid? It's the most joyful day, but the people that deserve it most don't experience any of it. And we wish to be forgiven. He says, then, finally, you grew up. You got a job. You learned how to speak a little bit. And that same tongue that you learned how to speak with, I taught you how to read, how to spell. I taught you how to say all of these words, and now you use that tongue to disrespect me? Allah says, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ That same tongue should not be used to, to say, just the click of the tongue is a sin in front of a parent. We do much more than that. And we can justify anything as I started. You don't know what my mother did to me. It doesn't matter. Allah didn't give us a, Allah didn't give us a framework in which we could do. We just can't do it. And then he finally says that if you can't treat me like a father, at least treat me like a good neighbor. That's how some of our parents experience their life. Neighbors living with us. And this man looks up and the Prophet of Allah's beard is drenched with tears. And he's unable to speak. And he takes his hand, places it on, this, on the chest of this child like this. He says, Anta wa ma li abik. You and your entire existence belongs to your father. Everything you own belongs to your father. No jurist or scholar has ever deduced from this hadith that a child's money belongs to their parents. That's not a fiqh ruling. It's simply to show that everything you own is because of him. 
everything you own is because of her. It's enjoyable to have a good time with friends for us because we are the beneficiaries of it. But sometimes in life, we should do things that make other people happy and that become a source of joy for them. And there's no one better to do it for that benefits our dunya. And I say this to youngsters, benefits our dunya because we care about our dunya. Benefits our dunya because their du'as are irreversible, good or bad. Good or bad. They're irreversible. There's nothing that can undo them. Three du'as go straight up to the heavens. Three du'as. A du'a of an oppressed person who is oppressed. There is no barrier between them and the arsh of Allah. The du'a of a person who is out in the path of Allah, learning knowledge and studying. And number three, the du'a of a parent for their children. It goes directly up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can I attain the objective of the month of Ramadan? If the conditions that apply to being forgiven are simply not being met by me. And those conditions are A, clean our hearts. We are brothers and sisters, not for namesake. Like, not because we like saying it. It's because I know how to clean my heart for them. Number two, parents being pleased with us. Majority of us are young. Majority of us are sitting here. And hopefully our parents are alive. May Allah give them long, healthy lives. Don't wait for the moment that it's too late and you're putting dirt on top of your father or mother. Because the reality of life is that it's going to happen sooner or later. It's, it's either they're going to be burying us or we're going to be burying them. And most likely, we're going to be burying them. And as we're burying them, I've been, one thing I don't miss after my brother Rahimullah is I don't miss janazas. And I've been to many janazas in which the children are burying the parents. And every single one of them, without exception, is a son or the daughter saying, I wish I never did this to my father. I wish I never said this to my mother. I wish I never spoke to them like this. Well, if that's the consistent consensus, then we're alive. Why can't we change it? What is, what is the barrier between us and that type of change? Nothing except for an ego that is self-centered and unjustifiable because we truly have nothing to be egoist, egotistic about. We're simple people. We're young. Everything we have is because of our parents. How can it be that I'm using my arrogance against them whilst they were the ones who gave me what I have? So let it not be that we live in this month of Ramadan, my dear friends. And I'm saying this to myself because this is what I've been thinking about for the last seven days as this month started. I have not spent a day at home since Ramadan began. And I don't seek sympathy. I enjoy serving the deen of Allah. This is our passion. This is what I wish I died doing. But if I had the opportunity to have iftar with my mother, I would do anything for it. And all of you have that opportunity. So why have iftar with anyone else? Have the late night snack with him. Right? At the Thai house. At somewhere else. Have iftar with your parents. Serve them. Don't make it awkward serving your parents. Make it normal. I walked into my boarding school once, a school that we have in Michigan that our students live in, and all the students were gathered in one corner. I'm like, oh my God, these guys are up to no good. They must be doing something wrong. And I come closer, and they don't move when they see me, or else if they were doing something wrong, they would have fidgeted. And what they're doing is flipping a bottle and attempting it to fall on its, on its base. And everyone's, oh! And when someone gets it, it's like, oh my God, they won the World Cup. Right? They've, they, got the bottle, they got the bottle flip. And they're just, they're literally doing this. Ask them, how long have you guys been here for? They said, one hour. I'm like, wow. And I was there for another 20, 30 minutes trying too. I'm like, I got to get this before I leave. And I got it after 20 minutes. My point is, if something as useless as a bottle flip can become viral, why can't something as pure as kissing our mother's hand become viral before we leave the house. Why can't we kiss their forehead? Why can't we hug them? Why can't we kiss them on the cheek? Why can't we buy them a gift? Not on Mother's Day. Not on Mother's Day. Formalities take away the beauty of the gift. No one feels beloved when you have to buy them a gift. No one. Because they know you have no choice. 
Love increases when you do something which is not expected, not when something is expected. No one's love increases when you do something when you had to do it, or it was your responsibility to do it anyways. Love increases when we do something for someone that they had no expectation for. So let it not be that in these days of the month of Ramadan, in these nights, we do everything else, but our elderly parents are unable to forgive us. All of us should make a covenant to ourselves that we will take the responsibility to have a number of iftars with our parents. Number, whatever number you want to do. Number. Everyone should write a number. I'm going to do 10 iftars with my parents. Five, seven, three, whatever it is. Do iftar with your parents. Can everyone say it, inshallah? Number two. This is what, my, this is what our teacher taught us. Number two. Try to drive your parents for taraweeh a number of times. Drive them for taraweeh. Who drove their parents for taraweeh today? Anyone? That's my point. No, I don't either. That's my point though. All of us have, how many of us have cars? Can you get a hand raise? Don't be shy now. Females drive too. How many of us have cars? A lot of us have cars. We had three people who raised their hand that said they drove their parents for tarawih. Force them to come with you. Tell them that you would be honored to take them for tarawih. We find ways to make our friends love us, but we can't find ways to make our parents love us again. And the third thing, last but not the least, in this blessed month, serve them what we call, in our language, we call it khidmat. You know what khidmat is? Khidmat is to serve them. Which means massage their feet. Which means to clean after them. Which means to support them. Khidma is something that you have no incentive from except to make that person happy. That's, that's what khidma means. Khidma means that you have no incentive from this act except the pleasure of that person you're serving. So do something that does khidma for your parents. Don't make it awkward. Let's normalize it. May Allah make us amongst those people that can truly be a source of our parents being proud of us because we serve them. Make us amongst those that while they're alive, they can say that I'm proud of my son and he makes me happy. My mother, my mother when she heard of my brother Rahimullah's passing, the first thing that she said after saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, the first thing that this mother of mine said, well, in Urdu, she said, Ya Allah, aap gawa hain ki mein is bachche se razi hoon. Aap, is, aap bhi is, is bachche se razi ho jayin. She said, Oh Allah, I make you a witness that I am truly pleased with this son of mine. You also be pleased with him. I don't know if I would have received that dua. And I'm not sure how many of us are receiving it right now. If we were to leave, are our parents pleased with us? And this is not a joke for us. This is real. Because the reality is they will pass away sooner or later. They have a few years left. Whatever we can do to make them happy, we should do it. And through that, how I started there is a possibility that forgiveness can be earned by us in the month of Ramadan. Without it, there's not even a possibility because we, our parents are displeased with us. Allah make us amongst those who can please them, serve our parents, serve our mother, especially our mothers. May Allah make us such that as they're getting older and more frail and their hair is turning white and gray, that we are there for them the way that they were there for us. That the way they taught us how to walk, we can help them walk. The way they taught us how to eat, we can help them eat. The way they taught us how to live life, we can help them live life at an elderly age. Most mothers and fathers, they don't want to live to an elderly age because they know that their kids can't serve them. They know that. But why not give them that type of support that we're right here. This is our honor. This is what we live for, to earn your du'as. And there's nothing that will increase, there, will not, there's nothing that will decrease from a child that serves his or her mother or father. May Allah make us amongst those people. Wa akhru da'awan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.